pleased to have with us this morning William Kozlowski, um, who most of you may be acquainted with through his book, The Business of Music, um, which has just been revised, and this is cut off the press the 1985 edition. Um, it's a comprehensive reference for all aspects of the music industry. Presently, Mr. Kozlowski is a partner in the firm of Feynman and Kozlowski in New York City. He's a former trustee of the Copyright Society. During his distinguished career, he's been aide to a federal district court judge, associate counsel of American Guild of all composers, and attorney for Warner Brothers Music Company. Today, we're going to hear in Mr. Kozlowski's own words some vignettes and stories behind copyright registration. And I have a feeling that you may also hear some of the stories behind the stories, which are really interesting. <laughs> Um, I know that the presentation is going to be fascinating and entertaining. I believe it's also going to be very informative and enlightening because of Mr. Krasilovsky's experience in copyright and the music industry. He's extremely well qualified to help us fulfill the purpose of the seminar series, which is to give those of us in the copyright office a broader view of what the copyright certificate, how the copyright certificate is used in the real world of copyright. Please welcome William Krasilovsky. Thank you for inviting me. I call myself a representative of the music industry somewhat because since 1963, I and a collaborator have been writing these books for Billboard, the trade paper of the music business, uh, called This Business of Music. And then we have another one called More About This Business of Music, which Jody uh, didn't know about. <laughs> and we're threatening to put out son of more of that. <laughs> But that's the story of collaboration. Now, what is interesting is that I want to talk to you people on the nuts and bolts of our own relationship over the years, and that is, what is employment for hire? What is a joint work? What is the impact of a derivative version? And there are so many fascinating stories behind all of these things that I find myself more a frustrated author than a lawyer. And you have to restrain me. In fact, I brought down 50 pounds of paper. <laughs> so really, I only, I only have two hours in which I can talk to you. But within the big satchel, which I'm bringing with me this afternoon to Howard University, are one fourth of the archive of Fats Waller's uh, business papers. I believe that the business biography of Fats Waller, who wrote Ain't Misbehavin' and Honey Suckle Rose, is as fascinating to people like you and me as the actual lyrics themselves <laughs> and the actual music, which was the work of a genius. I mean, within his catalog, uh, I've been doing this since 1959, working on the Fats Waller family uh, problems, uh, because a postal clerk came to me and he was in terrible trouble. He owed money to the government on back taxes, and his father had only left him $500 in the will. And uh, he was the only legitimate son of Fats Waller. Watch that word, legitimate. There were two others, you see. And the father preferred the second family. And uh, that was a father's prerogative to write a will, preferring the second family. But you and I know that for copyright renewal purposes, that then postal clerk with a $500 bequest had a fantastic business opportunity. And we've been cashing in on that ever since to the tune of over a quarter of a million dollars, well over that. This year alone, we're taking in $50,000. Now, that money rolled in so fast and furiously and was so much fun. And <laughs> really, he and I had such a wonderful, close, buddy relationship that he resigned from the Postal Service. <laughs> and his career, a very honest career, was to be my client. <laughs> now, Tom Waller was dedicated to his father's memory. And in no way whatsoever would he acknowledge that the $500 bequest was anything more than what he thought was a fraud of some uh, self-seeking managers and lawyers for the other side of the family. And so he wanted to benefit the memory of the father who died in 1943 at the age of 39. Now imagine 
How many of you are only, only the ladies are under 39 in this room? And he created such a great catalog of songs that this is it. What I did is I made an index card because I'm not as good as you. And uh, although we did have access to the, exam to the uh, research uh, services of the Copyright Office, I wanted to have everything on one card for one song. So for instance, all that meat and no potato. That's a song that you don't know about, but that's why I wrote it. And sure enough, who's his collaborator? A man named Ed Kirkaby. You know who Ed Kirkaby was? Ed Kirkaby was a former RCA executive who fell into a lucky thing by being recommended to become the manager. And as manager, he said, well, we're sort of partners, aren't we, Fats? And so he got himself not only a manager's commission on the records that were made thereafter, but also on the RCA records that were made before he even met Fats Waller. That's the world of a manager. And here is Ed Kirkaby as a collaborator. Now, you people doing your registrations will see it frequently that there are people claiming to be collaborators who also, by coincidence, are filing the claim. And it happens over and over again in the music business. It's one of the, it's one of the important aspects of my career to I try to cut out the cut-ins. We're presently working on a case involving Elvis Presley. Elvis Presley had a regular, see I'm digressing, but I hope you don't mind because I love the music business. I want to try to touch all bases. <coughs> Elvis Presley had a standing policy through his great manager. Colonel Parker was a 50% manager, not merely a one-third or 20% manager, but 50% of net as a manager is sometimes a lot better than these guys who say I'll take 20% of gross. That's quite complex and that's outside of the copyright world, so we won't discuss the world of management, except that managers frequently find their way into the copyright claims. Now, Elvis Presley had a standing policy that he wanted a one-third kickback from all songwriters of songs that he recorded. And in a case brought by Aaron Schroeder, I think it's Schroeder or Arch, Arch Music, uh, a judge said that the creative skills of an Elvis Presley in setting the arrangement and the style and the goodwill naturally inherent in his standing as a great recording star made that not an illegal contract to have a contractual grant back of participation in songwriter royalties. But I represent, my partner and I represent, Otis Blackwell, who is an absolutely great creative genius and who did deliver two of the most important Elvis Presley songs, All Shook Up, Don't Be Cruel. And he delivered them in such wonderful demo fashion. What's a demo? A demo is what uh, a p songwriter demonstrates on a cheap little recording to the great star or his producer or his A&R man, artist and repertoire of the record company saying, I want you to listen to what I think would be appropriate for your popularization. So Otis Blackwell delivered such a great demo that Elvis Presley fell in love with it and recorded it practically note for note without any change whatsoever. The arranging was almost identical. And sure enough, we find the name of Elvis Presley on the copyright registration of those two songs, as distinguished from most of the others, where it was merely a grant back from the other uh, writers. So we're now approaching the renewal stage on those uh, two great Elvis Presley hits, which are big fortune makers. One of them made $80,000 last year. Um, and we're trying to overcome what we recognize to be a presumption in favor of the stated authorship. So when you are registering the stated authorship, whether it is a manager or a other participant who might not have been the true creator, it's still subject to challenge, except you have to overcome that presumption. And we're willing to do that. And I think we're doing fairly well because we've gotten the original demo record. And we've gotten people who made the presentation of the finished demo record to Mr. Elvis Presley who can testify that he didn't make any changes from that, and then we can have experts come in and testify as to the final result in the original. Now, Fats Waller didn't need any demo record because he was a great pianist, great entertainer. 
He was such a great entertainer that he was accused by many people of going up and down the floors of the Brill Building, which is the center of the Tin Pan Alley of New York. Maybe there are 17 floors in the Brill Building. And I don't know if it's a true story, but I've heard it from seven different sources. And the story is that Fats Waller was generous and improvident and always interested in making a buck. And so he would demo the same song live on a piano of one publisher on the 17th floor, then go down to the 16th floor and demo it again, and then on the 15th floor demo it again. And they'd all say, great, wonderful, and they'd rub their hands. And they'd all think that they got a great new song. And the first one to get the registration is the one who won it. <laughs> and he would get an advance, you see. And then he would, <laughs> he would then share that advance generously with everybody who was uh, his current coterie. And it would be fun and games. That was the story we heard. But now, that's why my favorite relationship with Tom Waller Jr. was so challenging to me, because it went the other way around, too. He was on Broadway with songs in, I think, Connie's Hot Chocolates. When he needed some money, and he went up to the Mills music people and said, I need $500. And they said, well, maybe we can come around to giving you an advance. And they gave him a paper that a, an expert lawyer draftsman for real estate deals probably prepared. I'm delighted with that. It wasn't a copyright specialist. And they left out. And, well, anyway, he died. They, they didn't have a renewal grant. They said, for and in consideration of $500, he gives up all and the entire interest in his royalties on the following 20 songs, including Ain't Misbehaving. All right, so that gave up his royalty participation. But, and that's one reason why only ASCAP was around, because ASCAP is so paternalistic that they will not allow sellouts of writers' interests. No matter who knocks on the door at ASCAP and says, hey, I just paid $100,000 to buy a piece of Ain't She Sweet, ASCAP won't say hello to them and won't allow that transfer. And I think that it's still subject to legal challenge as paternalism. In this day and age when there are Alan J. Lerner's and Cole Porter estates, and Bob Dylan, a great real estate investor, why shouldn't they be allowed to make a sale of their rights? Judge Felix Frankfurter said in regard to When Irish Eyes Are Smiling that a restraint on alienation to protect the author against his own improvidence may restrain him or his heirs at a time when they most need the money. And I have some clients who have tremendous health problems. They have no children and no spouse, and they're maybe 81 years old, and they'd like to sell and be rich for three more years. They're not allowed to sell. Only once in my career was I successful. I sold Never on Sunday. My challenge was from a Greek lawyer who came into my office with worry beads. I love that. And he was there stroking his worry beads. He needed to get a quarter of a million dollars fast. And he wanted me to arrange the complete sellout of all in the entire rights on Never on Sunday. And we tried every possible device. And it's very, very difficult to sell performing rights. But BMI was a lot more cooperative on that subject than ASCAP. BMI is a competitor of ASCAP in the performing rights field. Uh, so we got $175,000. And only subsequent to that did I find some people claiming that there was a public domain background to the origin of the music of Never on Sunday. But let me go on. I can go on. So on Fats Waller, I frequently say to uh, attractive people who come to my office saying that they regret the foolish deal they made three years ago. I signed away rights that I should never have done. What can I do? And I tell them, you can drop dead. But <laughs> Now, that's only for songs that were written before 1978, because as you know, as of 1978, we don't have renewal clauses anymore for new songs. So <coughs> Drop Dead is exactly what Frankie Lyman did on Why Do Fools Fall in Love. And we presently have litigation on for Frankie Lyman's musical interests. It turns out that he did drop dead on time before the renewal occurred. but. He also was quite unlegalistic, and he apparently got married three times without a divorce. <laughs> so I have personally negotiated in a hotel room with the first wife, who got married, she said, in 
Tijuana, Mexico, and she brought along a chaperone. Uh, chaperone was 85 years old, and the two of them came in first class airfare from California, and they were going to charge it to my client who was interested in acquiring the renewal rights from the first wife. And after all, the first wife who is uh, recognized as such is the one who gets the claim for the renewal. So we negotiated with Zola Taylor, formerly of the Platters, and she was a very convincing lady, and uh, the only trouble is that she has yet to deliver to us the marriage certificate from Mexico. And in Mexico, they have a number of states, I guess it's more than 10 states of Mexico, and they don't have a consolidated marriage bureau, and I guess we don't either. You know, what would uh, you do if you lost your marriage certificate? And I guess you could go, yes, but that's the trouble. Oh yes, it was a, a marriage parlor where she got married, and so we're still searching for that one. So I went to the second wife. We found her by advertising on the radio, looking for uh, another wife in Philadelphia, and we found her and she's in jail. So we <coughs> conducted business negotiations in jail, and we've acquired her rights too. Now there is a third wife who married him while he was in the army, just before his death. And so there is a conflict between these three wives as to who gets the renewal interest. Now one of the ways in which we hope to proceed is to say regardless. On the second wife, we had have a marriage certificate, except that she was underage. <laughs> but she continued in her marriage relationship into her maturity, but she was previously married without a divorce. <laughs> but when you continue a marriage relationship into your maturity, and you then get a divorce from your first husband, you are then a free agent to get married again, and if you're in the right state, at the right hotel, <laughs> registering as husband and wife, you have a new flag to fly under, a common law marriage. So we have the common law marriage claim of Zola Taylor, who got married in Mexico, where they have some funny word for it. I can't, it translates to concubinage. <laughs> I wonder why they say that, but I think that Mexico has that history of the uh, traveling uh, priest who only comes to town every two or three years and, and legitimizes marriages, and until such date, maybe they have that bad word. Sounds quite offensive. But, uh, so we have two possible com common law marriages uh, to rely upon for that renewal situation. Uh, in the Fats Waller repertoire, I have a song called Please Take Me Out of Jail, because he was put in jail for alimony failing to pay his alimony on the first wife, except he didn't have a divorce from the first wife. Now what we did was we established that in New York, my former postal clerk client was the only child because in New York we didn't recognize illegitimate children. Now, see now you're watching this in the year 1985 you're preparing who is a child, and the child is defined under the 1978 statute as including illegitimate children. Now, I think that's wonderful, because American citizens are born in America. Whether or not they're born in lawful wedlock or not is irrelevant to their citizenship status. But as a advocate lawyer, I had to assert all possible rights for Mr. Fatswaller's firstborn son. And the federal statute does not apply retroactively to take away the legal rights that had been established for Thomas Waller Jr. And that's why he's getting this. Uh, he gets the only American royalties. Now what we did for him is we have more than quadrupled the money that would have been coming in normally if his father had just signed a conventional contract. Because the first time we knocked on the door, we said, hey, here we are, my daddy's dead, and I want to sell a renewal to you. Will you please give me $20,000 advance and a uh, conventional 50% uh, music publisher uh, cop copyright royalty situation? And uh, that was okay. We got that. Then the next time around was the 19-year extension when a song hits its 56th year. As you know, there's a notice of termination. Are you people in that field enough 
you're examining original claims, but you do recognize some of the termination provisions. So we knocked on the door again and we said, hey, here we are again. You're the nice new publisher that we selected, taking it away from the Mills people who had given a $500 outright. And the nice new publisher uh, was Gene Aberbeck, who was considered by many in the publishing fraternity to be an outcast. I mean, imagine breaking the fraternal feeling of us publishers by bidding to buy rights that were legitimately established by the United States Congress. I mean, they actually put him out as an outcast and wouldn't allow him to be a member of the ASCAP Board of Directors. And I, I really respect Gene Aberbeck and Julian Aberbeck's uh, reputation. They are now running art galleries on Madison Avenue, but they made fantastic millions of dollars being the publishers of Johnny Cash and Elvis Presley and now on the Fats Waller songs and many important works. They fomented country music in the days when it wasn't recognized by Hollywood and uh, Broadway uh, under the firm name Hill and Range Songs. And they were German refugees. Now, that's great. Imagine coming over as a German refugee with a heavy accent and establishing country and Western music and getting Johnny Cash to. <laughs> but I don't think it's funny. I think it's great, really. It was free enterprise. And the music business is free enterprise, right down the line. Now. So we knocked on the door of the successor of Gene Aberbeck, which he had made a deal with Chapel to take over. We said, here we are again, it's 56 years, or approaching 56 years, and we would like to get half of your profits. And when we're computing half of your profits, we want to get half of your ASCAP profits too, because that's something where we've only been getting half of the writer's money. Now we want to get half of the publisher's money, so in effect we're doubling what used to come in to Mr. Thomas W. Waller, Jr. My client was so delighted, it was so wonderful, and, he was, and the show was opening on Broadway, winning a Tony Award, and his father, he was bringing his wife to the show, and 24 hours later, he died of a heart attack. The excitement probably killed my friend. But this afternoon, I'm going to Howard University with the archive of Fat Swallow Papers, together with another installment on the first $25,000 that we've given to uh, Howard University in honor of the memory of uh, that's Walla. Now, how many times can you skin a cat? You think that I'm done on Fat Swallow. I'm not done. In England, Canada, Ireland, South Africa, Bermuda, Hong Kong, New Zealand, and wherever the sun does not set on the British Empire, which still exists for the music business purpose. We have found a reversion of copyright for Fat Swaller. And we got 160 other families to cash in on our discovery for what Tom Waller in his career as my client and I did. We found that the sanctimonious bar and publishing fraternity of England had a rule against contingent fee lawyers, just like they had turned up their nose against Jean and Julian Aberbach, German refugees who came to America and deign to have country and western and rhythm and blues music break through. The British were looking down their nose at any lawyer who would think of fomenting trouble for a piece of the action. That's me. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I'm really very low key, but I enjoy the idea that I was the one who blew the whistle on the conspiracy of the publishing and legal fraternity is not to give widows the rights to recapture their copyrights. So in England, we have what we call reversion of copyright 25 years after death. Now the widow is no longer crying and she's probably wearing a red dress. 25 years after her husband has died. I mean, what? how impractical can you be? And of course she doesn't have a lawyer at that time, but that's the time when she can raise the flag, knock on the door, and say, here I am, I want to recapture all rights. And they laughed us out of court. And we had to spend $250,000 to establish a House of Lords victory. And we won in the House of Lords, and 160 families on 40,000 copyrights are now the proud revised copyright participants on something which had previously been filtered feverishly. What's filtering? When Ain't Misbehaving, well, we didn't get any money at all on Ain't Misbehaving for all those years. And we still don't get paid in Germany, Japan, and France, and Italy. But 
when money was coming in on a conventional song, like As Time Goes By, <coughs> you must remember this, a kiss is but a kiss. So conventional music money would be collected in England, and they would take half of it for the English publisher and send the other half over to the American publisher, Warner Brothers, on As Time Goes By. And then the American publisher would give either its one-third or one-half to the songwriter of everything except performance money, the ASCAP money. So that's filtered once. And the worst publishers are the ones who filtered it three or four times. From Italy, it would be filtered into Denmark. And Denmark, it would be filtered into England. And England, it might be shot back to Germany. And then finally, it would be half of a half of a half of a half before the American songwriter or his heirs would get his half of American receipts on foreign money. That's multi-filtering, but basic filtering is conventional. Now, we've knocked out all of that. On 40,000 songs, we've knocked out any filtering because we had to get somebody with a quarter million dollars. So we went to a great man named Fred Beanstalk, Freddie Beanstalk. And we said to Freddie Beanstalk that if you will lay out what I anticipate to be a reasonable budget of thirty to $50,000 for legal fees, we will arrange for you to be our administrator on a co-publishing basis. And that great man didn't flinch when it got up to a quarter million dollars and kept going. And he appealed and he kept fighting the case and we won. So we're now going through all the British Commonwealth. And the British Commonwealth includes South Africa for some reason. We think it might include India. We're still trying. We think it might include Israel. Why in the world would Israel be there? Because, you see, we know it includes Spain. Spain was never even part of the British Empire. But the British were so <coughs> admirable in their copyright statutes that even Spain adopted by reference the then applicable British law. And so, of course, the then applicable 1911 British law of reversion of copyright is applicable for 40,000 of these songs. So let me give you a little vignette on a song I just dropped the title of, As Time Goes By. That's the most successful song of our entire 40,000 victory. One year alone, we made $100,000 for the songwriter, who, of course, had been dead for 25 years and didn't have a surviving spouse and didn't have surviving children. It's going to some cousins, I think, in Vermont, and they're shocked. <laughs> they keep calling the bank saying, why are you sending us this money? <laughs> and it's so, much, it's so much fun. All right, now, watch this, because this is within your world. Where is As Time Goes By identified? How many of you realize that it is the essential Ingrid Bergman song from Casablanca? How many of you do know that? All right. So every time that great movie is shown on television, there's automatic performance money from the ASCAP or PRS or other appropriate society. And every time they do a Humphrey Bogart takeoff on a commercial jingle, and they want to have a little musical identification in the background. There we are, hungrily waiting for our $50,000 fees <laughs> for allowing the song to be synchronized in a commercial jingle. It's great. <clears throat> but why is this song not an employment for hire song? After all, what? you people are examiners, and you're doing movie clearances. Uh, of copyright registrations, and you know that a movie is the epitome of employment for hire. After all, a movie is a 20 or 30 million dollar budget item with hundreds of people. You can't watch the Oscar Award show without being bored to uh, extinction by listening to the credits. I must also recognize Milos <laughs> Foreman. They all say it. That means I must recognize that it was a teamwork. I love the one Dmitry Chomkin get on, got on, and he said, I must recognize my collaborators, Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms, <laughs> <laughs> which is what I want to talk about later, public domain. But as time goes by, why it didn't I lose the reversion case? Because just like in American copyright, you can't get a, you can't knock on a door and have anyone smile at you and offer you money if you are merely an employee for hire. You lose all those rights. That's the game. Employment for hire is the immediate flag of defeat. As soon as you have that, it means you've got your bucks first, and you're never going to bother them again. Under a 35-year termination notice, or a 28-year renewal situation, or a British reversion situation, you got your bucks first. And even the Gershwins did that. 
and Alan J. Lerner might have done it for Gigi, but he certainly didn't do it for My Fair Lady because it was a previously existing play. You've got to be employed for hire in the original origin of the film and its contents. Now, as time goes by, comes from Casablanca, and that was absolutely from Casablanca. It had not been a previous existing song. But the story goes this way, that Ingrid Bergman was performing in Casablanca, leaning against the piano with a sultry voice singing, you must remember this, a kiss is but a kiss. And that was the only exception to the entire score. The entire score was by one of these absolutely great Hollywood composers. If it wasn't Dmitry Tiomkin, it was on his level. One of the great composers of Hollywood had gotten his great big fee for doing an entire movie score. And the director had a momentary lapse and allowed an outside song to be interpolated. I like the word interpolated. That's what it was. They allowed that song to be interpolated for that one little nightclub scene, a kisses but a kiss situation. When the great Hollywood composer saw the final rushes or whatever. Is that the right word? <laughs> he complained to holy hell. He thought that was terrible. I can't have my integrity uh, diminished by having an outsider's song in my score. Either you want my score as it is intact for the entire movie or kick out all the rest of the music and use this guy Hupfeld, Mr. Herman Hupfeld, whoever he may be. Let him write all the hard work and do the rest of the score, and they, they gave in. They said, you're right. We did a terrible thing there, and we're going to knock out that song. And they got on the phone and they called up Ingrid Bergman and said, you've got to come back. Sing another song for a nightclub scene. It's just another one of those songs. After all, that's the nature of the music business. They didn't know they had a hit that was going to make $80,000 in the year 1984. How would they know? Just as much as Mr. Fats Waller didn't know that all that meat and no potatoes would be a failure and, as, and Ain't Misbehaven would be a success. How are you going to know what's going to be the hit and what's going to be a failure? And that's why we have these protective devices of the 35-year terminations and the 28-year renewals, because music and copyrights generally <coughs> are not stocks on the New York Stock Exchange. They don't have a history. It's really a question of whether the Vogue is going to hit it. So he called up Ingrid Bergman and said, come on back, let's give in to our great Hollywood composer and you sing the song again and we'll be done with that nuisance. And we'll let Mr. Uh, Herman Huffell keep the $500 or whatever it was that he got for uh, putting in that special song. And he'll never complain anymore. And she said, I will cooperate, but there's only one thing you've got to know. And that is I'm trying out for the Ernest Hemingway uh, movie What's the movie that, uh, where they were sleeping in a double sleeping bag in, the, in Spain during the revolution? You know, the sun, what is it? Sun also rises, and she said, and I had to cut off all my hair to be a gorilla. And so they said, gee, as time goes by, it has to stay in the film. <laughs> so that's the story of as time goes by. Let me tell you, let me tell you, uh, in the New York Times recently, they said Rod Stewart works hard when he gets on stage. He runs, he kicks, he shows off his wardrobe, he twirls his microphone stand, he wiggles his hips. That's Rod Stewart. All the while singing and shouting in a celebrated raspy voice. Okay, what does that have to do with copyright? What does that have to do with charity? Well, here it is. In 1979, I was hired by United Nations to protect their sister organization, UNICEF, against an embarrassment. It seems that there is, I've mentioned before that I'm not going to talk about managers, but they creep into the music business at all times. A guy named Alan Klein is, he, he loves the fact that he's reputed to be a tough, rough manager. And Alan Klein had been the manager of the Beatles when they had done a major charity gift for starving children someplace before Bangladesh. And uh, they had donated the proceeds of a record to the starving children. <coughs> and this charity situation was allegedly the subject of a misuse by their manager, Mr. Terrible reputed Alan Klein, who got the record company to give him many, many, many hundreds, if not thousands, of those records 
which he then sold for his private personal gain. That's the story. Uh, Alan Klein runs, he's on the stock exchange under a Abco Industries. He's very successful. So anyway, the United Nations and UNICEF didn't want to have that embarrassment of the misuse of a charity or allegations thereof. And so they said, let's get a music business expert who's a nice guy, who's not going to mess things up, and they, uh, that's my reputation. So I went in as Mr. Nice Guy, and the question was, I was going to get a gift from ABBA, John Denver, the Bee Gees, Barry Gibb, Rita Coolidge, Chris Christopherson, ABBA, Earth, Wind, and Fire. They were always going to give the gift of one musical copyright, and Donna Summer. One musical copyright was going to be given to the children of the world and Rod Stewart. So Rod Stewart was one of the donors. And there he is with his wiggling his hips. And the song he wanted to donate to the United Nations was, Do You Think I'm Sexy? Now, we had Kurt Waldheim, who was the Director General of the United Nations, uh, participating in the audience. And sure enough, the manager, the important manager of uh, Barry Gibb and the BGs, who organized this entire big operation, insisted that Kurt Waldheim and Bill Kraslowski and uh, or anyone else who's probably over the age of 30 must sit in the mezzanine. And we only have young kids in the front. And we're going to take over the United Nations Assembly Hall. And we're going to make a million dollar extravaganza, and I'll get the million dollars from NBC, don't worry about it. You people are lucky, lucky, lucky. You're getting a million dollars from NBC for this charity. Isn't that wonderful? You're going to say thank you on the microphone. We'll bring up Mr. Waldheim. He'll say thank you after the uh, stars have their day. And we were worried that, do you think I'm sexy is going to embarrass that man? The great Kurt Waldheim. Is that his first name, Kurt? The, what? Yes. The great Mr. Waldheim sent word through his underlings, please, Mr. Stewart, will you substitute a different song? It's just like the same thing that we talked about as time goes by and uh, all that meat and no potatoes. You can switch a song. A song is a song is a song. That, uh, hey, pick another song, Mr. Stewart. Will you please give us another song? Take a title. Jealous of me. Why don't you give us Jealous of Me? It's just the same thing. And we prevailed upon Rod Stewart to please don't give us the embarrassing song of Do You Think I'm Sexy? And he was adamant. He wouldn't do that. He said, this is the best song in my current repertoire, and I'm really honest in my charity. I want to give away the best I've got. And he was right. That song is about, I think that it's probably the first, if not the second or third, of all of the songs of the contributing great stars of that 1979 charity. And so he was entirely right, except for two things. All the other great stars had managers who cooperated and allowed us to get Chapel Music, which is one of the world's largest and most successful and renowned publishers, to administer free of charge as their, uh, as their contribution to this charity for the United Nations. But the manager, Mr. Billy Goff, in England, refused to allow the gift to be given away because he had made his own worldwide arrangements and he was going to honor the gift subject to his 10 or 15 percent administrative fee, which he thought was absolutely fair. And so we had to say, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, because when you are beggars, you can't be choosers. And uh, we had the song, uh, Do You Think I'm Sexy? Then there was one other handicap, and that is that Warner Brothers had already laid out tens of thousands of dollars to the collaborator. Because every song that you are registering, you always notice that there's more, that aren't all Herman Huff bills. More and more these days, we find there are multiple sources, collaborators. All right? So the Warner Brothers Music Company that had already bought the rights from the collaborator on Do You Think I'm Sexy didn't want to contribute one penny of their part of it. So we only got less than half of Do You Think I'm Sexy for the gift. And even that, less than half, subject to a 15% charge, brought in more money than most of the other songs. And that's all nice. But what do you think happened next? <coughs> knock, knock, knock on our door. We hate to tell you, this is a call from Brazil. But during his last tour, Mr. Rod Stewart came down to Brazil and must have been inspired 
because the melody is so similar to our song that we feel that we have to bring a lawsuit for a copyright infringement. And we said, my God, you're going to sue the children of the world? <laughs> <laughs> and we embarrassed them, and we told them about how wonderful our charity, that was my pitch, that there must be some way out of this, that can't we find a way to be friends? Wouldn't you like to contribute your part? <laughs> and they said that they wanted to be rich and famous like Rod Stewart, too. And so we found a device which I've used three times <coughs> since. And the device to get rid of an infringement claim so that nobody has egg on his face and everybody is friend, our friends is we will hereby undertake to have Rod Stewart record one of your other great songs. Remember the same old silly stuff about all songs are fungible goods like wheat and rice? You know, when you buy Rice Krispies, you don't care whether you get the first box on the shelf or the tenth box on the shelf. Well, it's complete fiction. Songs are not fungible goods. <laughs> but we did it. And we managed to get the guy in Brazil to contribute a song not to the charity, but for demo purposes to Mr. Rod Stewart. And he, Rod Stewart guaranteed that he would record one of the other songs for his very next record. And in addition, just in case that other song wasn't a big hit, we'll put your name on the record of the United Nations UNICEF Children of the World album, which is another story in itself. I might get into that. And so in small print at the bottom of that, after they give credit to all of the people of the great management teams who cooperated on putting together the great record of this great event when we took over the United Nations Assembly Hall, we say, the song, Do You Think I'm Sexy, Mr. Rod Stewart acknowledges with thanks the inspiration of Mr. So-and-so of Brazil. And that's all polite. Now, we did exactly that same thing with the Beatles. The Beatles had a situation where Lennon and McCartney were recognized as the creative geniuses before George Harrison had the uh, initiative to assert himself in Ringo Starr. And in the great days of the Beatles, all songs were written by Lennon and McCartney. And you people registered this. Lennon and McCartney, Lennon and McCartney. Was that ever McCartney and Lennon? I don't know. Yeah, I think sometimes it was McCartney and Lennon. Now, so it turns out that I was engaged by the publisher of a Chuck Berry song. The Chuck Berry song is a song that has tinges of payola to it. What's payola? Payola is incentive bordering on bribery of people who can make or break the song which might have been fungible goods yesterday but is going to be a hit tomorrow whether we, uh, uh, if we use the proper initiative. So Mr. Alan Freed, who was sent to jail for payola as a disc jockey, was the person who came in with what I think is legal payola here. He said to the publisher and record company of Mr. Chuck Berry, who is a rock and roll genius, I'd like you to contribute a song for a movie that I'm putting together. In the old days, the less sophisticated people said, I'd like you rock and roll stars to come and perform at the Brooklyn Paramount, because I'm putting on a uh, little show for my fans, the disc jockey would say. And I'd like the record company to let me have a thousand LPs to give away at, as door prizes. Now that's payola, <laughs> you know, because obviously the disc jockey's gonna get on the air and say, gee, you kids, you must come to my Brooklyn Paramount show and I'm gonna feature the best songs and the best artists of the day. And then he would rattle off, including Mr. Chuck Berry. Well, this was a movie that he put together of rock and roll stars of the day. And the song was You Can't Catch Me. And Chuck Berry had a little thing about, uh, he had an imaginary car called his Airmobile. And it went, New Jersey Turnpike in the wee wee hours. I was rolling slowly course of drizzly showers. Here come a flat top, he come rolling up with me. So and so, so and so, and so and so. And 
we court Mr. John Lennon. John Lennon in Abbey Road, a record that sold eight million copies or more, had what I think is uh, the same problem that Jerome Kern had, subconscious infringement. After all, great geniuses don't have to go out and steal. But it's so hard for you people who just heard me recite New Jersey Turnpike and the Wee Wee Hours to remember that it came from my mouth to your ears and that you now know that little phrase. And when you go home and your kid wants you to write a little poem and you say, gee, I think I'll write about New Jersey. <laughs> New Jersey Turnpike, yeah, I think it's in the wee wee hours. How do you like that? <laughs> now, a year from now, you won't remember I told it to you. And so John Lennon was in that situation. Now, I interviewed Mr. John Lennon. What happened was I hired detectives. We were suing him. We hired detectives, go serve John Lennon with process. And the detective would start at 9 o'clock every morning. We tell him that John Lennon was in Los Angeles today, and he's going to be in San Diego tomorrow, and he's going to be in Spokane next week. And from 9 to 5 every day, that detective was looking for Mr. John Lennon, and he couldn't serve him. Of course, he was sleeping. <laughs> John Lennon and Yoko Ono would start operating at 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night. And of course, you'd never find them on the street. And they'd have several bodyguards anyway. So we went to this terrible-tempered Alan Klein. Remember I told you about the manager of the Beatles? Well, my client is as rough reputation as uh, Alan Klein. My client in the Chuck Berry case was uh, a man who runs a record company called Roulette Records. And uh, he can talk on honest, straightforward terms with anybody in the music business. And so he got on the phone. He said, enough of this. We don't want to have to have detectives looking for him. We want to get this done in a way. Let's get the case rolling. So Alan Klein said, all right, have your lawyer sleep in my apartment. And I'll arrange for a secret rendezvous, because we don't want anyone to know where he is. We don't want the press to know. We don't want anything else to know. And they didn't even let his lawyer know. <laughs> So there I was, sleeping in the manager's bed with my wife. And <laughs> my wife stays uh, in the apartment on Broadway and uh, 46th Street when bodyguards come and they wake me up and they take me for a 1 o'clock in the morning rendezvous at the penthouse suite of some fancy hotel and Yoko Ono was there to scold me. She says that Chuck Berry ought to thank the, uh, kiss the ground that John Lennon walks on. He's, John Lennon and the Beatles have made Chuck Berry an, uh, a household word around the world, and they've used his songs. You know, after all, the Rolling Stones had done whole uh, sets of uh, Chuck Berry material. Chuck Berry wrote Maybelline, Johnny Be Good. Great rock and roll hits. But although he was being coached by this aggressive wife of his, my God, she was telling him everything to say. He said, in effect, like an American Boy Scout, I cannot tell a lie that Chuck Berry was my rock and roll poet. And as a boy in Liverpool, I would study his records and I'd listen over and over and over again. I couldn't even understand some of the words because his accent was so foreign to my Liverpool speech. But I will say that I did hear that song, New Jersey Turnpike in the Wee Wee Hours. And I didn't even ask him to acknowledge that the words were similar because the words were similar. I hired a music expert from Tuskegee Institute. One of my clients and friends was a professor of music there, William L. Dawson, who communicates with you people regularly. He loves the Copyright Office. William Dawson registers his works with fantastic correspondence. How many of you recognize that name? Oh, isn't that great? Yeah, well, he's one of the great men in the music business in my book. And oddly enough, he's one of the only people I represent that I recommend stay with CSAC, which is a competitor of BMI and ASCAP, because he does arrangements of spirituals. So of course, he gets less than a full credit at ASCAP or BMI, whereas CSAC specializes in arrangements of public domain work. OK, anyway, we had Mr. William L. Dawson as our music expert to show the similarity in the melody 
as well as what we could all recognize from the words, because Abbey Road says, here come a flat top, he come moving up with me, or grooving up with me. So we had enough basic fingerprints of originality that were copied, and we were doing so great. And we went before the judge with the deposition in hand, because John Lennon wasn't going to show up to contradict us. He was too important to appear in court. And the judge listened to the story and said, I don't know rock and roll, I don't know who Chuck Berry is, and I never heard the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> and we went through our whole thing, and we had the charts prepared by William L. Dawson, and they had charts, and they had multicolored charts, and we had black and white charts. I felt that the case was really endangered because I didn't have multicolored charts <laughs> like they did. <laughs> and the judge who was square, at self-pronounced Squaresville, was so in love with our presentation, he asked us to go through it again. <laughs> <laughs> because he called in somebody else from the back room uh, who was going to be his next year's law clerk. He wanted to have th uh, the whole thing recited again. <laughs> that night, I'm a nervous willy about litigation. And I prefer to plan and strategize and not be the great poker player in court with uh, television uh, antics of how you win cases. And so that night we settled the case. We settled it in the same Rod Stewart fashion, that Mr. John Lennon would agree to record a certain number of additional songs on his next album. It was going to be called Roots of Rock, and he guaranteed to do more than two Chuck Berry songs. And everything was such a nice, easy settlement to come along that way. So that's one way to settle a case. The, case, the story goes on deeper and deeper after that, which I think I won't tell you about because Rolling Stone wrote it up and other lawyers were involved in the subsequent events, which involved putting out the record of Mr. John Lennon doing the Roots of Rock without Capitol Records' permission. So other lawyers were involved in that. <laughs> and the judgment against Mr. Morris Levy of Roulette Records was to pay a dollar a record for every one of the records that Capital sold, even though he only sold 25000 So he had to pay well over $150,000 for having transgressed upon the rights of Capital Records as the exclusive John Lennon record company. Right now I'm talking about the uh, music industry. I want to talk about arrangers. I went through the works of Richard Rogers, which numbered several hundreds. At the time of his death, it was probably about two or three hundred copies. And I counted how many arrangements were there. How many of you have actually seen arrangements registered by Nelson Riddle, who was famous for Linda Ronstadt's Watts New Album? How many have you seen arrangements registered for Gil Evans, who was Miles Davis's producer, arranger, and general collaborator? The great arrangers of today, Fletcher Henderson, hardly ever get recognized in your office. And I think that's one of the misfortunes of the copyright industry. Because I went through all of Richard Rogers' works and I find arrangements only by what would be considered to be semi-hacks, the people who are truly the employees for hire. An employee for hire is somebody who works under the supervision and control, like a movie industry person, for a salary. I used to work for Warner Brothers, and we saw those arrangers. They actually wore green eye shades <laughs> because they just kept on doing it. They would arrange for the bassoon. They would arrange a violin solo. They would arrange for a drum accompaniment. They would arrange everything for the elementary school or high school or college marching band. But they were not on the level of Fletcher Henderson, Nelson Riddle, or Gil Evans. And so in all of the works of Richard Rogers, who wrote My Funny Valentine, My Romance, My Heart Stood Still. There were only 27 arrangements that I could find, and not a single one was other than things for the Hammond organ, for military band with solo clarinet. How boring! The great arrangers are shortchanged in today's music business. Now, with all these publishers and managers who put their name on as phony collaborators, on songs of the great artists of today, why are the arrangers given such short shrift, is my question. So we still have a few crusades left 
in the music business. And I'd like to see somebody go out there and crusade for the arrangers. Okay. <laughs> oh my God, I've been trying to time this. All right, you ready for the story about evil ways? Have you, has anyone heard the Santana record of evil ways? It was a worldwide hit. Here's the story. There was a meek little man named Clarence who was residing in jail on manslaughter. He was convicted of manslaughter and he was living in jail, but he did have six dollars in those days and a guitar. And while he was in jail, he wrote a song under the title, You've Got to Change Your Evil Ways. And he sent it off to the copyright office under the name Clarence Henry. And then he lived out his sentence and he got out on parole. And this meek little man who's a lovely person wanted to run the straight and narrow path and live decent and proper and perform all requirements of parole. And, but he was a musician. And as a musician, <laughs> and I, I really, no, I, sh I shouldn't have said but. Yeah. <laughs> as a musician, he got an engagement, which they call a gig, as a sideman for Willie Bobo, who is a respected jazz musician. And Willie Bobo had a manager. The manager always comes through, and his name was Teddy Reig. R-E-I-G, and he's another one of my less favorite managers, or maybe my most favorite managers, because most of my manager stories are that managers are difficult people to do business with. And Teddy Rieg engaged Mr. Sonny Henry on parole to play probably guitar on the Willie Bobo session, and Clarence Sonny Henry, during a break, in playing other people's music, went up politely, probably figurative, figuratively hat in hand, and said, please, sir, would you listen to a song I happen to have here? Uh, you've got to change your evil ways. And they say, okay, kid, we'll put it on. You know, they can always put on a 10th cut on a nine cut album. Nine songs can become 10 songs. Therefore, you can play up to 40 minutes on an LP. So they put on the song written in jail by Mr. Sonny Clarence Henry. They didn't ask him any more questions. And they put the publishing name Gil Sand Music. That's Teddy Riggs and Willie Bobo's company. Because they assumed that they automatically would be inheriting the right to own the copyright. What is a publisher after all? In the music business, a publisher is not what a book publisher is. It's not E.P. Dutton. It's not Harcourt Racing Yovanovich. They don't have warehouses full of hardcover books where they pay a lot of money for paper and binding. My book costs $4 in plain old out-of-pocket cash to print and bind. And I, as a self-serving author, put into all of my contracts that I may buy my own books for promotional purposes at cost. And so I know it's a $4 cost. And so publishers in the book business frequently multiply by five. What's five times four? That's 20. The new book is $19.95. I mean, it's fantastic. Okay. <laughs> now I'm gonna go on with the evil ways. Now continuing on the evil ways story, Willie Bobo put out a record and it was on a modest little label, uh, something of a quality of Verve records, which is not an insult, but it's not a big hit. It sold 15,000 copies. Now, 15,000 copies is not at all interesting to Columbia and Warner Brothers and RCA. They don't want to have any artist that will sell 15,000 copies. And uh, they discourage people from coming in as an artist if that's their goal, to have that kind of an audience. So Willie Bobo obviously wasn't doing much, and uh, the song Royalties in those days were two pennies. So what's two pennies times 15,000? It's not that much to really quarrel about. 
of who's getting the mechanical royalties. And anyway, Gilsan had an inner edge with Verve Records, and they automatically were picking up the money on their self-serving claim of an oral assignment. In those days, before 1978, there could be an oral assignment of copyright. There could, there, now, I shouldn't say that. In those days, there could be an oral assignment of a common law copyright and of the privilege of registering a copyright thereafter. And remember what came in the early story, and that is little Sonny Henry had the six dollars, and he sent you the six dollars and he got the registration, but he also was close-mouthed and didn't tell Teddy Rigg about the earlier registration. Okay, so that thing is sitting there, hidden away, the registration, only one person in the world knows about that registration, Mr. Sonny Henry, sitting there knowing that he had registered the song and Teddy Reed was stealing it. But he didn't want to make trouble. He's on parole. Leave things alone. But something happened. Just like I told you before, the New Jersey Turnpike and the Wee Wee Hours might be infringed by any of you within the next year or so. A man named Santana heard Willie. He must have bought one of the 15,000 records. I bet he didn't buy it. He probably got, he probably heard it on the air because if he bought it, he would have been able to read Gil Sand music. And he didn't know who wrote it. And he didn't know who claimed to own it. All he knew was that he liked that song and that it wasn't his. And he was honest enough to say to the Columbia Records people, go out and find who has the rights to that song called Evil Ways. I locked so evil ways starts with an E. You've got to change your evil ways starts with a Y. And somebody at CBS Records looked up in the ASCAP directory. You go to either ASCAP directory, that's very easy, or you call up BMI Index, that's almost as easy. And you say, hey, who registered the song Evil Ways? And there was only one guy who registered a song under the title Evil Ways. It wasn't Sonny Henry, he never did. Evil Ways was registered by a man named K.A.Z., so they printed Kaz on the record of Santana. Mr. Kaz was one of the few honest people in the music business. He refused to take the checks. He didn't give a license. He didn't write the song. And yet his name was on that label. So Sonny Henry came across the fact that Evil Ways was being played to death on the air as performed by Santana, he went out and bought a record, and he said, my God, I got an enemy named Kaz. <laughs> <laughs> he went to his brother. No, 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 watch out. No, he didn't go to his brother at that time. During the session, oh yeah, remember the, the honest guy on parole who wanted to make a living and not get in trouble with his parole officer. Uh, he wasn't going to drink, but he went to a bar with the other musicians on a break in the three-hour sessions that you normally have a three-hour working session for uh, making records, and you get paid union scale. And uh, they can't produce more in that three hours than, I think, somewhere between five and 15 minutes of recorded music. The union will not allow you to do a whole album in any three hours. So you have to keep on shoving those three-hour sessions in there and getting honest union scale. So they went off to a bar for a break, and the other musicians were, of course, drinking hard liquor. But the parole uh, Lee, Mr. Sonny Henry, had a glass of milk. He was at the bar when he saw a big, impressive gentleman named Richard Carpenter who was having a Coca-Cola. They had something in common. And they got to talking. They had never met before. And he said, I've got a couple of songs that I wrote. And the, uh, Mr. Richard Carpenter said, well, that's a coincidence. I'm a music publisher. How do they go? And he sang, you've got to change your evil ways in the bar. And Mr. Richard Carpenter said, I'll give you $50 a piece for two of those songs. Come to my office. And they went off after the session. They went together to his home, which was his office. Because in the music business, which I say is the fount of free enterprise, you can operate from a telephone booth if you have to. Many of the people who do that, you got a quarter, you're a music publisher or you're an agent. <laughs> now, Mr. Richard Carpenter is a very astute, experienced person who has been a record producer of important jazz acts and who presently is the manager of Stanley Turrentine and has done some of the world's greatest negotiation. I sit in admiration of his negotiating skills with how can he get contracts for $225,000 per LP 
Oh, I forgot to tell you, I, my best was $3 million. I got $3 million when the, I had the UNICEF charity thing, so of course I had God on my side. <laughs> I, that was the best I ever got, $3 million advance for one record. But Mr. Richard Carpenter has done the best I've ever seen on a hardworking manager situation of a quarter of a million dollars, $225,000 for a jazz LP. Now this is the same guy who said, I'll give you $50 a song, come to my office, and they went to his office and he had a printed Passantino form of pr uh, music publisher contract and Sonny Henry signed the contract, took the hundred dollars, and therefore it was for valuable consideration that he sold and assigned any and all rights in and to the song, You've Got to Change Your Ways. And Mr. Richard Carpenter said, well, when you can get around to it, will you please give me a lead sheet so I can register this? And Sonny Henry didn't say a word. Back here. He had registered the copyright. He didn't tell Mr. Richard Carpenter, the $50 investment man, that he already had registered the copyright. And a year or so went by, and he didn't get in touch with Mr. Richard Carpenter at all. And Richard Carpenter said, well, that's the music business. You know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. He lost $50, lost $100. But Santana was making a hit out of this thing, and Sonny Henry started worrying, and he went to his bright brother, half-brother, and he said to his half-brother, whose name was Towns, what do I do about this man named Kaz, who's claiming my song? And the brother said, well, that's a difficult problem, but let's form the SAH, Sonny A. Henry Music Company. We'll make a partnership of it. I'll take half, you take half, and we'll protect your rights, and we'll go out and do everything we can. And he hired a lawyer. And in the music business, it's, we laugh every time we see a real estate lawyer come in. They, it's really, somebody has said copyright is the metaphysics of the law, and uh, abstract is the word. And these real estate lawyers with their printed forms of buying and selling and leasing and everything don't know how to operate whatsoever. They couldn't get rid of Kaz at all, even though Kaz didn't want to take it. And so they got rid of the lawyer, and they went off to the big guns. They went to Paramount Pictures which had a company called Ensign Music, and they said, gee, we need more help. We two partners in this Sonny A. Henry Music Company have a song that we know is written by, and again, they didn't say registered, written by Mr. Sonny Henry, and he'll sign an exclusive songwriter contract for all the other songs that are coming up if you'll give us enough of an advance and take on the burdens of knocking off cares. So Ensign Music gave him substantial money, but they in turn went to BMI because they know how to uh, grab money in the pipeline. There's always money in the pipeline in the music business. There's as much as nine months delay in picking up the cash. And so they went to BMI and they said, can you give us some money in front? We're going to sign up Mr. Sonny Henry because we know that we can achieve the licensing situation on Santana's hit. So they got $5,000 from BMI, and they probably gave another $5,000 out of their own Paramount Pictures coffers. And so they then said, we are going to be the administrator, and we're going to get our 15 or 25 percent administration fee, and then we'll be a co-publisher with the Sonny A. Henry Company for this operation. And they arranged for printing the song, and they did all the things that music publishers, some of the worst things you can say about a music publisher is that they sit on their ass cap. <laughs> and don't do anything. Now, instead of sitting on their ASCAP, the Ensign Music arranged for printing the song. That's one nice thing. So maybe it sold 7,000 copies in print or whatever. It's not important, but they, they didn't check the copyright office. And back here, Sonny A. Henry still had his copyright registered on his original jailhouse song. <coughs> so Paramount Pictures was able to go to Columbia Records and give enough warranties and representations that they are the complete and absolute owners so that they could start getting the getting cars knocked off. That was no big problem. But Gil Sand was around. Along came Teddy Rigg. He was claiming that he had something too. So there were the following claimants. Richard Carpenter, the fifty dollar purchaser in the bar, Ensign Music, the administrator and $10,000 advancing party for co-publishing and administration rights. Mr. Towns, the half-brother who was now the partner with Sonny A. Henry in the Saw Music Publishing Company, and poor little Clarence Henry, the parolee. The 
quarter million dollars was mounting up. And who do you think won? The $50 barman. Why did he win? Because he was the assignee of the later discovered registered song where the intermediate purchasers for value had failed to register their assignment. Now, we had to go to an appeal court on this thing. And my role was as an expert witness in the trial because there were other lawyers handling the case and they lost to the following effect. That the original trial judge was trying to be Solomon. And Solomon cut the baby in half. Well, he did the same thing. He said, you, Mr. Carpenter, you $50 uh, purchaser, should bear some of the costs and expenses of poor little Sonny Henry. They, everyone likes Sonny Henry. And uh, you and Sonny Henry must share the costs uh, of paying off all of these innocent people who came in, the half-brother and Ensign Music. And of course, he knocked out uh, Teddy Rigg, who never had anything, because Teddy Rigg had no, not a scintilla of written evidence of any assignment whatsoever. And the mere fact that somebody is a musician on a date doesn't mean that you automatically uh, acquire the copyright if there had been a registration. So the judge in the trial court knocked out Teddy Rigg and Willie Bobo, and the trial court judge tried to do the Solomon's Justice thing of charging against the quarter million dollar pot, which would upset my client, Richard Carpenter, the $50 investor. And so we went on appeal and we established that he didn't have to contribute any part of it. And the songwriter who had signed and made written arrangements with three different conflicting publishers had to bear the uh, damages out of his limited share. So Sonny Henry had to make up for it. And what the good manager did, remember I said, Richard Carpenter is one of my favorite managers. He went out and he got Stanley Tarantine and other artists to cover the song in order to make more money. Just like I get rid of the infringers by saying, will you go away and we'll make a new record of your next song? Well, if you want to make more money in order to help pay your bills for the past, all you do is to make more records. Now, that's what happens in the music business. The cover records uh, of a standard song like As Time Goes By can mount up to be over 700 versions. So it's so much better uh, business situation to be a copyright proprietor of an underlying song than to be the high risk taker of doing the quarter million dollar recording that might make it or break it. And yet, there's a lot more glamour about being a record artist and record uh, company than being a music publisher and songwriter. But the guys who go to the bank even 25 years after they're dead in England are frequently the guys who write the song. Uh, here, I'm going to tell you about a case we had which affects, which, which was determined based upon what you people did for us. I represented a group called GQ. GQ is a magazine called a Gentleman's Quarterly, a fashion magazine. And these Brooklyn, no, no, they were Bronx. Bronx slum post-teenagers were working for a record company that I don't like called Delight Records, D-E-L-I-T-E, -E, calling Rhythm Makers. And they had songs like You Better Believe It, Funk and You, You're My Last Girl, Monterey, and I Can Feel It. They were so poor that they had to sleep under the piano because they couldn't get car fare to even get on a subway to go home to the Bronx. They were really poor, and Delight Records arranged for their manager to be uh, getting a percentage of whatever money would come in, and the manager would hire a road manager who would take in the proceeds of their gig money in the little bars and grills where they were playing, and they were poor. Along came Delight Records, and they hired two guys who are likable fellows who were making believe they were black and they were white. I mean, why in the world do we have to have white people write a song called Soul on Your Side? And they were going to have these poor black kids appeal to the uh, community with the following lyrics. 
He was born on the fourth floor of a tenement slum out of 15 children. He was the 13th one. No one stopped to celebrate his birth, just another teardrop on the face of the earth. You know, all right. So it's a message, nothing terrible about that. And uh, Rahim Leblanc told me the following. I mean, he's a lovely, uh, creative guy with a lot of energy. He's always dancing. Every time he comes to my office, my God, I can't, I have to look all around, <laughs> dancing as he talks. And so I'll read you his statement, because what happened was that Delight Records sued them. As soon as they changed their name from the Rhythm Makers and became GQ and sold two million records, they sued them for having the nerve and effrontery after they no longer were being recorded by Delight Records. And they weren't given a budget. They weren't given studio time. They weren't given assurance whatsoever of any career potential in any way, shape, or form. Delight Records sued them for having a frontery of becoming a hit on somebody else's record. And it is true that the hit called Disco Nights sounded very much like Rhythm Makers. I gave a lecture to a community college music school, and I played the original version of Soul on Your Side, and then I played the Disco Nights hit that brought in a fortune, two million sales, and I have them raise their hand as to whether in the test of infringement, which is what the judges say, we don't want to hear the experts tell us whether in their expert musicologist opinion this is or isn't an infringement. What does the plain layman's ear determine? And these kids said that they heard the similarity. Substantial similarity is what the kids said. And if I were playing it for you, you probably would say the same thing. Now, I won the case by maneuvering in a shrewd manner based upon you and your uh, operation and the registration. Here's what Mr. LeBlanc said. While I was in the Rhythm Makers, I was the lead rhythm guitarist and the lead vocalist and the basic arranger of the overall program. I was credited as songwriter on the songs that I previously read to you. But with regard to the one song, Soul on Your Side, the lyrics were written by a man named Ebby Woolley, who wasn't a member of our group. And the basic lyrics start, he was born on the fourth floor of a tenement slum out of five children. He was the 13th one. When these lyrics were presented, the following people were in the room. Billy Terrell, he was the producer of the date. And he was sitting at the piano. He was working as producer and arranger. My buddy Herb Lane was the keyboard player. And my other friend Sabu Cryer is the bass player and drummer. And we had another guy named Kenny Banks in our group. Billy Terrell played a single chord on the piano. He said, does this fit the mood of the lyric? That's what the producer said. One single chord. Let's say F sharp, whatever, minor, whatever. <laughs> My process is a natural kind of thing where it comes from inside of me. Now, this is a kid who, he's going to tell about his age later on, but when he was reciting this to me, he was all of 19 years old. And he was telling me the story about what happened when he was under 18. And he was, he was uh, telling about the misery of sleeping under the piano and not having anything to live on. My music just comes together impromptu. I was looking for direction for the tune. When he gave me that chord, I just thought of the type to build it from. I thought of today's mood. I dealt with that in my spirit. From that chord, I did the melody. The story or message of the song gave me the vocal direction. When I did the song, I started from the beginning with an intro. Watch that. When I did the song, I started from the beginning with an intro. Remember that. I had that ability to hum as if I were an instrument. I know I, don't use, I didn't use any instrument at that time. And as to the writer's credit, I was young. I was unfamiliar with what writer credits are. My birthday is December 29, 1956, so I was under 18 years old when that happened. Even though I was underage, I had signed management contracts with the record company. I had signed publishing contracts with the record company. I had signed exclusive record artist contracts with the same record company. I never had a lawyer until now. I was never advised whether I should join ASCAP or BMI by these so-called managers and publishers. It's not my nature to complain about anything. I chalk this up to experience. 
paying your dues is what these young kids are always doing. I wrote the complete lyric and melody of other songs that were used on that date, but I cooperated on what they thought would be the hit song of this session by doing the Soul on Your Side song. The song was never previously recorded, and it was submitted and rejected, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> uh, the reason, let me go on, I'm going to skip because I don't want to just read to you. The major difference between the two tunes, the one that was a hit, is that the lyrics are completely different. The similarities between the original song and the hit song is that the bass line which we kids created, the guitar licks which we also created, that's the identifying accompaniment which is vital in disco music. When you listen to disco music, that beat gets through. No one listens to lyrics in disco music. They're busy dancing. I play a completely different piano line on the tune itself. That melody line is not the same. The vocal melody line of Soul on Your Sign and Disco Nights is completely different. There are no similarities if you get down to the bold, basic essentials. This is a young kid telling me, a copyright lawyer, and that's what we won the case on, because what we did was we trapped the other lawyer into relying upon their copyright, which was deposited with you people. And you, when you look at this thing, you know what you're doing. Of course, we don't, there was not a single word of similarity in the lyric. All right, so we knock out the lyric claim. Now, they had a bold, stupid, simple lead line of the melody lead sheet of the melody. So the disco flavor doesn't come through whatsoever. And they went all the way through the trial without realizing that they could have cured their defect by running in and having a secondary registration, including the actual sound of the arrangement. And they lost the case. <laughs> and they never knew what hit them. And they then said the lawyer is a great lawyer, and he got paid over $25,000 for that trial. He's now our friend. I mean, you get to know people <laughs> over the years. He's now our friend. He comes up to our office, and he confides. He said he was having marital troubles or something at that time, and he didn't know, he didn't research properly. And so he ran into the New York State Court saying, oh, my God, I didn't win on a federal court. Well, I'll win on a common law copyright. That's what I'm going to do. And he ran into the state court, and we knocked him, uh, we brought in some such motions on the state court, because after all, copyright cases are supposed to be brought in federal court. And so we won that case for the kids. But unfortunately, they had a management problem. It always happens. The manager in that situation came to me, he's very good looking, tall, six foot, three inch, former basketball player. He said that. You may have gone to law school, Bill, and I respect what you have to contribute, but I learned in better than the school of hard knocks because I was in jail. That's what he said were his credentials of being a manager in the music business. <laughs> 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 and sure enough, he, he bought a house in Scarsdale. <laughs> <laughs> and the kids are miserable. I mean, really, one of them asked me to please be his caretaker to give him $150 a week allowance from the limited money that I was able to get. I think I got him $35,000 on the victory as his share. And he didn't trust himself, so I had to be his uh, father's substitute and handing out $150, and it's gone. I mean, my God, I'm so upset. What do I do now? And he, when he, he, he still looks to me for advice and guidance, but he doesn't have a second hit. Because not everybody is Fats Waller, who can create another hit tomorrow. I mean, he keeps on sending in more demo records, and no one is taking it. Especially if you're a drummer. And that one kid, the $150 a week kid, was the drummer on the hit. And drummers are being replaced by synthesizers now. So don't let your children grow up to be drummers. <laughs> It's really a terrible situation. <coughs> uh, should we take a break and answer some questions? I've got 500 more stories, and then I have 50 pounds of papers I want to. Well, let's have some questions, OK? Yes. Uh, back to Tess Waller. You, you said that your client uh, 
um, got settlement for the U.S. rights, and then you were talking about the British rights, and you mentioned something about 116 families. Yeah, we, I, I don't understand. How does that all work? Well, what happened, you see, was that you can't bring a, what is a class action. You can't put in a quarter of a million dollar fighting a test action unless you get enough action to warrant the investment. How could I have gotten even a, a saint to put in $250,000 just for Fats Waller's rights alone? Because Fats Waller's rights would give him the possibility of making maybe an extra $30,000. You don't put in a quarter million dollars legal fees for that. So what we did was we went on, we went and formed an agency called the Miriam Rose Stern Agency for uh, uh, Composers of States. And we got fantastic families. We have songs like My Wild Irish Rose, As Time Goes By, uh, Button Up Your Overcoat, Cuddle Up a Little Closer, April Showers. We have some of the world's greatest in the 40,000 songs. We had to get an attractive package put together in order to have the financial clout to get an investor to fight in the courts of England. And that's what we did. So we got 150 or more families together. And we gave those families a standard form contract saying that if you will participate in this test action by giving us your British rights, we will undertake to get a publisher as agents for you, family members, will undertake to get a publisher who will make you a partner. Because that's my goal, always to get a piece of the other guy's action. And that's what we did. So all you do is basically buy the suit. Oh, yes. <laughs> he bought the privilege of, uh, of the possible victory, and then he won. And now he's bought Chapel Music together with uh, Rogers and Hammerstein. And I think that this case helped establish his credentials with people like Rogers and Hammerstein family. And my, he's a fine fellow, and he has a good reputation as a wonderful administrator. But I do think that by having the nerve to buck the establishment and to establish new rights for writers of state certainly enhances his reputation in my eyes. Yes? Yes. Uh, what do you think Redwood is a wonderful name, isn't it? A California tree for an English law case. <laughs> <laughs> but why was it Redwood? Because you see, in England, they have a uh, situation. Remember I said the sanctimonious lawyers said, don't allow the uh, pirates to come in here. We're getting a piece of the action just like a bunch of ambulance chasing negligence lawyers. That's what the English lawyers say. And they have something else. And they say, and whoever wins the case will get his legal fees on the other side. So the quarter million dollars has been refunded. <laughs> That's nice. Well, I'm very sad about it. I mean, see, remember I talked about the woes of the arranger, that the Fletcher Hendersons and the Gil Evanses don't get a piece of the action. Well, why in the world should a music publisher who frequently is in the category of sitting on their fat ass cap, collect money on a terminated song that the Congress of the United States has said should go back to benefit the family of the writer or the writer himself. Why should that, the result of that Supreme Court decision was they said, we disagree with the Second Circuit of Appeals that a music publisher is me merely a middleman, collect, opening envelopes and collecting checks. We disagree with that position, and we feel that the music publisher has a right to continue to be the conduit of passing on the royalties on recordings that were made during his period of ownership and control. Now, Tommy Dorsey, when he recorded Ain't She Sweet, had his own arranger do it. He didn't use the hacked arrangement of the marching band for Keokuk High School that was put out by the music publisher. Mills Music Publishing Company did not contribute to the uh, success of the Tommy Dorsey record other than to be the licensing agent for the copyright. Now, why should they continue? I feel it's a terrible injustice, but that's the way the ball bounces. Five to four decision, and I love counting up judges. Have you tried that? There was a trial judge who happens to be the same wonderful judge who handled my GQ case. He's great. 
And he ruled in favor of the publisher. That's one, in favor of publisher. Then the Second Circuit of Court of Appeals, unanimously by three wonderful judges, said that the songwriters are completely right. So we now have one against three. And then we had a five to four decision <laughs> in favor of the music publishers from the United States Supreme Court in incomprehensible logic. <laughs> so counting up all the judges, we won. <laughs> <laughs> but we've got to live with it. Now the next problem is the publishers are saying, and when they play that Tommy Dorsey record on the air, will you please tell ASCAP to give us the money on the terminated song? And I say, what? <laughs> what did you contribute? Why is that a derivative right? You see, the word derivative is so important. They think a recording is a derivative. We know that. But record companies are the ones who take the business risk and do the creative work on making that derivative sound recording. The music publisher didn't do it. But why in the world should there be a right of termination with a string attached to it, saying that the old publisher who is terminated shall nevertheless continue? You know what's wrong with that case? That they, we didn't have the fat swaller, ain't misbehaving situation because these judges said that they shall continue to be the conduit for letting the money flow, half and half. If we had a fat swaller ain't misbehaving situation, they would have said, my God, injustice, the publisher doesn't pay royalties. And then, you see, bad cases make good law. Might have been applicable at that point. Let me go on. I can go on and on. Uh, in the Redwood case, after we won in the House of Lords, and uh, we counted our victory with 40,000 songs, they did the same thing as Who's Sorry Now. And the publisher started one of those Who's Sorry Now sort of cases. And so we settled. Because I believe in settlement. I love hustling. I mean, that's part of the game. So we settled in order to have an orderly transition and get rid of any further possible delay because it could have kept on like the Who's Sorry Now case. So they never have decided that issue in England as to derivative rights after the Redwood. And uh, it's still an open matter. Uh, can I tell you one little vignette, please, on settlements? <laughs> on uh, Buddy De Silva was a great songwriter, a member of the team of De Silva, Brown, and Henderson. Buddy De Silva was also a vice president of one of the major motion picture companies. And he wrote fantastic songs like April Showers and Button Up the Overcoat. And uh, his repertoire consisted of hundreds of wonderful songs, most of which were written during a three-year period with De Silva and Brown. De Silva, Brown, and Henderson is the favorite phrase because watch those and, De Silva, Brown, and Henderson. It's a real team. It is the true joint work. If I ever want to define a joint work, I say it's De Silva, Brown, and Henderson because they really wrote around a piano and it was sort of like that boy, Raheem LeBlanc, reciting about how we all contributed and no one knows whether it was only half one way and half the other way, words by one and music by another. So that's a true collaboration situation. And that was the essence of the Redwood decision, that it's not a collective work. Collective works are encyclopedias where they collect miscellaneous contributions from a lot of different contributors. And so if it were a collective work, it would have been excluded from the English reversionary law. And so we won. That's what our major victory was. But in England, we won on the principle that words are one copyright and music are another copyright, that it's parallel tracks, just like a railroad. And never the twain shall meet. The words are owned by one for purposes, and the music is owned by another. And therefore, each has their own 25-year after death recapture situation, except where it's a joint work of Silver and Henderson. OK? Now, we, oh, yeah, settlements. So Buddy De Silva died, and he had no children, no legitimate children. But he had an illegitimate child, and he was proud of that. And he was one of the people in California who acknowledged to everybody who could come into his office, want to see a picture of my son? Because he was proud of the fact that after a long, happy marriage, he had a child by his then secretary. And he wouldn't allow her to think about an abortion, and he didn't want her to be unhappy whatsoever. And he was going to set up all sorts of trust funds. And he was very happy about the whole situation. And his secretary was somewhat happy, too, about it. And uh, 
They went one step further. The, the young boy sued Warner Brothers, and I was a lawyer for Warner Brothers, and won all the way to the Supreme Court. In fact, he, his lawsuit was financed by these Aberbachs that I mentioned before, the German refugee people who uh, uh, financed a lot of uh, exploratory events in the music business. And they did a wonderful thing. They established the right that it's possible to be an illegitimate child and an American citizen entitled to copyright benefits if you're from California. That's what it was. And most people forget that if you're from California because that's where, or other states where they so recognize it. So we lost in the United States Supreme Court, and how do you overturn that? And we had, I had a boss at Warner Brothers named Herman Starr, and he never would allow us to say we lost. And he, he hired somebody to try to overturn the Supreme Court, and how do you do that? <laughs> well, he went to the Solicitor General of the United States to go back and to prove that there was a comma left out when the statute on rever renewal was sent off to be signed by the president. And maybe we could get the Supreme Court to reconsider the decision. And of course, that lost. And then I came in, and I was the nasty uh, hireling who hired a detective to go and take away the bad name from that boy. The bad name, you know, usually you want to give a good name to an illegitimate child. Well, you have a shotgun wedding, right? But this guy didn't want to get a divorce from his happily married wife. Buddy De Silva never did get a divorce and didn't have any shotgun wedding and acknowledged paternity, even in his own will. So what happened was we found that Buddy De Silva was so rich that he paid $500. He sent his lawyer with the pregnant secretary to Tijuana, Mexico and said to the lawyer, go get that lady a decent husband so that the child can be born in lawful wedlock and have a proper name. And he was being kind. I'm sure that that wasn't dastardly. He just wanted to do the right thing. And so the lawyer gave $500 to a sailor, United States sailor, to go through a wedding ceremony in Tijuana, Mexico. And if they had my experience with uh, Zola Taylor and Frankie Lyman, I guess, uh, the lawyer was necessary because he brought home the wedding certificate. We can't find ours. Well, anyway, so I had to go looking for the sailor. And I hired a detective to go from San Diego up and down the west coast of the United States looking for a man called Moscovita, whose only known connection to the whole event was that one night when the lawyer sat outside all night long on a bridge chair to make sure they didn't consummate the marriage. They had pictures, wedding pictures. And we found him. And it, you know, it was like 20 years later. <laughs> he said, please don't tell my wife. <laughs> I'm happily married, and I was just a kid on a lark, and I must have had a few extra beers, and I took the $500, and I then went through a divorce. See, we were able to find him because of the divorce papers we were able to locate. So Buddy De Silva had bought a good name for his illegitimate child. And we went back to the lower district court and started the whole proceedings over again, saying that although the Supreme Court had certiorari of a question of does an illegitimate child inherit under the copyright laws when California allows such recognition, can we were denying, as Warner Brothers, we denied that he was an illegitimate child. We said that he was conclusively presumed to be legitimate of a lawful wedding because he was born in lawful wedlock. And so, sure enough, Mr. Gene Aberbeck saw a good thing. He had already won, and he split the difference with us. <laughs> but that's the music biz. You cut up the pie. <laughs> All right, give me another question, please. Yes? Do you know uh, any background in this new case uh, concerning the Beatles with uh, Yoko Ono? And yes, I was an extra witness in that one. That was a producer case. Recently? Yeah, the big recent money. Oh, this is what happened, see. John Lennon was on the outs. He was not producing hits. In fact, when I was handling my case and I was settling, my tough guy client said, John Lennon is not the Beatles. We need more than one song to be recorded by John Lennon because he can't deliver individually the kind of big market that the Beatles had originally delivered. So we need more than one song to be recorded if you're going to settle. All right, now that's how things were tough 
even the great falter. But no one knew that John Lennon was going to be dying of an early uh, tragedy. And Yoko Ono, being a dominant woman, dominant wife, called herself a producer. And they had done things like the Two Virgins album. You know that, where they actually insisted that uh, Tetragrammaton Records put out an album jacket of the two of them naked because they were asserting their freedom of speech. And uh, this record was not going to be put out by uh, Capitol Records because they didn't want to put out a, a naked... Uh, duo uh, cover, so Tetragrammaton Records did it as a special exception. Now, he didn't have a major market and he was worried about whether he would be embarrassed. I guess he might have been coming out of a drug problem too at that time. And so they got a producer with whom he was quite friendly and, tr and had a good working relationship. And they said to this producer, will you come in and work with us on the condition that Yoko Ono will be your co-producer, and that we reserve the right to kill the entire project and not put the record out if we don't like what happens. And so he said, well, I will want extra high royalties, and I think it was a four-point royalty, something good, even though there was a co-producer situation. Four percent is a lot of money on an 898 record, four times 8,000 is 36 pennies. 36 pennies times the kind of millions and millions of records on the posthumous release record. And sure enough, they had enough to put out two LPs. And Yoko Ono was so opinionated that she wouldn't allow a reasonable settlement to be made. And she was insisting that he had doctored the documents to change the numbers. But this has, not, has nothing to do with copyright. This is all a record industry squabble where she lost. And she's reputed to be one of the world's richest women but she certainly didn't use business sense in negotiating that. Yes? The current one? Oh, the current one. Isn't that the one by the guy in Chicago? Which isn't it? There's one I read about in Variety. I wonder, is that a Beatles thing? No. I'm talking about the one where George Harrison and uh, well, George Yoko Harrison. Ono sued Paul McCartney. Oh, well, that's, an in, well, that's a interpartnership situation, I imagine. I don't know more than like that. But uh, there is an interesting thing where one of the great blues artists of Chicago is now waking up and bringing a lawsuit against some great artist of today, something like 15 years later. And why in the world do you do things like that? Of course, it is possible. We have a three-year statute of limitations in copyright actions. But that doesn't mean you can't sue for the record that was sold yesterday or last year. But you just have lost an awful lot of the, uh, of the money that came through the pipeline 10 years ago. But there are funny things going about in the music business at all times. Got a question? Yes. Uh, you were talking about alienation a while back and how some songwriters want to sell out all their interests. And um, ASCAP had something to do with uh, stopping those kinds of deals. But <coughs> they aren't parties to any of those agreements, are they? Well, no, ASCAP, you see, ASCAP is a membership association. I used to say it's like a co-op between authors, composers, and publishers, ASCAP, composers, authors, and publishers. In fact, in Europe, they have it such that two-thirds of the money goes to the creative authors and composers, and one-third goes to the publisher. We in America have 50-50 split, the inviolate pot, half the money and they take in well over $150 million a year. Half the money goes into one pot for publishers, and half the money goes into another pot for writers, and then they allocate it according to their mysterious but well-publicized sampling system. Absolutely honest, both ASCAP and BMI. And so they have this inviolate pot situation. The publisher gets their money, and in no way is allowed to invade the writer's side. Now, even when the publisher has made a major advance, we, for instance, as Warner Brothers, gave $1,000 to Mr. Bob Dylan when he came into the office at the age of 19. We gave him $1,000 because his then manager wanted to give him enough money to subsist on while he was getting his first records out. And with a $1,000 advance, we were able to get results of blowing in the wind, Mr. Tambourine Man, um, don't think twice, it's all right. And some years have brought in over $200,000 for that investment. And sure enough, the manager had a half publishing interest. 
he got us to lay out the thousand dollars and I asked him to assure me that the artist would participate in his half publishing and I think that they have litigation on between them at this time I don't know the results if, if I'm a songwriter and I have my pot that's do me nobody can keep me from selling my pot to anybody else can ASCAP they? does they do. ASCAP says we will not allow an assignment of membership it's a membership association and you may not assign it except to your family members when you die I try to do it in divorce cases and um, it I know that it has been done. Some of the world's greatest uh, creative geniuses do get divorces, and alimony does assert its rights, and so ASCAP will defer to those instructions. Yes? Right, one more question. Can you sell, uh, can you remain a member of ASCAP, but sell rights that you would have gotten under other songs to somebody else? Oh, yes, you can be a publisher. Publishers can wheel and deal and sell pieces of their action to anybody they like. So the publisher's pot is always available for alienation in any way, shape, or form, and it's being done. You know, Coca-Cola now has Unchained Melody and the works of Rachmaninoff. But just a minute. Coca-Cola bought the works of Rachmaninoff last week. I represent the Rachmaninoff family because Coca-Cola owns Columbia Pictures. Columbia Pictures has a music printing outfit called Columbia Pictures Music in Florida, and Rachmaninoff has an awful lot of paper that is a burden for the average music publisher that likes to just collect from ASCAP. And so now Coca-Cola is the publisher to whom I will look for getting paid for Rachmaninoff works. That's one of the subjects I'd like to talk to people here about, and that is why is it public domain? When Rachmaninoff left Russia in 1918, and we didn't have any copyright relations until 1972 with Russia. Why are the Rachmaninoff early works not allowed to be registered late? I'm not sure whether they have been registered late. And I, that's what I'm presently investigating. What is the, do we have a temporary public domain in the United States? In South America, there is what they call a two-year penalty for certain countries that if you fail to register on time, then you have a two-year waiting period before you're allowed to come in and clean up your uh, operation by getting out of the temporary public domain. My question to you people is, is that applicable to an American domiciliary who happens to have written his symphonies when he was in Russia? And he never printed in the United States or countenanced a abandonment of copyright by printing in the United States? What would be the situation on some of these works of Kabalevsky and Shostakovich, Kachaturian, Rachmaninoff? I love the music business. These are always open questions. Yes? That would depend on, on where and how and when it was first published. And a lot of Russian composers don't have any rights because they, they were Russian. Well, I'm. I'm saying that Once if it was while, first published oh, in Russia, did that, yeah. did that constitute an abandonment of American copyright? Well, we both stole from each other up to 72. Mm -hmm. See, well, I went to a speech this Monday by Harrison Salisbury saying that America was one of the deprived countries uh, until the year 1790. We were stealing from England all the time. That's true. Yeah. So who are we to criticize uh, Taiwan? <laughs> <laughs> And he was saying that he will write as a compulsion to be a writer, regardless of the economic motivation. And he challenges the copyright lawyers to contradict him, because copyright lawyers love to quote the judges who say that it is a constitutional grant in order to encourage the arts that we give copyright. And that's why people who otherwise would be starving in garrets can have enough money to buy food to create upon. And he challenges us. And I feel it is absolutely true with a lot of people that there is a ember waiting to be fanned into a flame that no matter what, after driving a cab 80 hours a week, they still will go home and they'll create their poetry and their, uh, their songs. But I believe that 85% of all works that come across your desk are economically motivated. Any other questions? Yes, um, yep. Back on the subject of joint work, um, what would your opinion be about the majority of songs where there's a lyricist and a composer? 
Do you think it's safe to assume that most songs are a joint work? So from our point of view, we often are presented with the facts of the separate authors, and only one of them is stating that he's a claimant. I think in the United States, a song is a song. And for instance, I'm involved with the song Around the World in 80 Days. And uh, I was very pleased to see it played on the uh, Oscar Awards show this Monday night. But I only represent the lyric writer. And the lyric writer gets paid from Muzak, which is playing instrumental music. So I think we have, we have a tremendous clash with the English philosophy, and that we believe that a song is a song, and that the marriage of words and music is such that each of them have an undivided interest in the total copyright. And we don't have the English parallel copyright system. Now, what do you think is justice between the two systems? Should the lyric writer participate in Muzak Elevator plays? Should Alan J. Lerner get paid when Fritz Lowe's melody is played in an elevator? What do you think? Well, it might never be played in an elevator if you had to come and get song in the first place, and the words are part of what made it here. Yeah. It is the true. The song is more than yeah. the sum of the parts. Yes. Well, in America, I believe that our rule is that it is a joint work and it is an undivided interest participation. Any other questions? You have one? Yes. I just wondered if you knew any real facts in the Yakubian case in 47. Uh, what, what's, the scope, what's the identification of Yakubian? Uh, he had registered his symphonic music before it was uh, produced as a sound recording. And uh, they claimed, the opposing side claimed, because it was a sound recording, that that was a performance which placed in the public domain, and they lost. It was a landmark case. I happen to know the music, and that there are some other funny facts about it. I just wondered, it was someone who sued like Ken Murray. Now, I don't know that particular case, but we have one going on right now <coughs> with Boy George. Boy George has comma, 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 comma to me, and we represent Jimmy Jones, who had comma, 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 the same melodic uh, accompaniment and the vocal sound. Now, we have Oscar Brand, who's curator of the Songwriter Hall of Fame, who says that that is the important hook. That's the identifying part. And it is true that when they were advertising Boy George's arrival in New York, that's all they played, comma, 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 uh, for the intro. Now, is that sufficient to be substantial? Now, the other side is saying that we've dedicated our work. In fact, somebody in this room may well have been involved in our re-registration because we did the same silly thing. Our people registered merely the bald lead sheet without the uh, portion that I uh, just recited to you because ours became a worldwide hit three times. Got to be number one on the Billboard charts with James Taylor. And Handyman is our song. And so what we did was we rushed right back to you and made a secondary registration as if it's a derivative work with a full arrangement. Did somebody in the room handle that, Handyman? Or maybe it just went through. But we did get it. <laughs> but anyway, we, we certainly wouldn't bring a lawsuit. After having one in the GQ case, we wouldn't bring a lawsuit without having something in the Copyright Office to qualify as a base for the lawsuit. Now, they are coming back and saying, well, you put it in the public domain before registering it by allowing it to be a worldwide hit in a sound recording. And we're saying, nuts. In no way whatsoever. But sound recording is not a publication of the underlying work. Right. Well, that was, that was for abandonment purposes. In this case. Yeah, but I think it is a publication for purposes of your registration. So it's confusing. But I believe for lit litigation purposes, it's not an abandonment publication, whereas it's a publication merely for your, what, what is the function of identifying a sound recording as a publication? What, what is the uh, justification of asking that question on the current uh, forms? Yeah. Because we no longer measure duration from that date. What is the purpose of the date of publication?
Right. If it was before 78. What? It does, it establishes priority as to where that part of the money was being held up. It, it does it through a term, though, as, as Joey said, in, under the 76 Act, too, for uh, works made for hire and on the Yeah, that would be applicable. All right. But I believe that the sound recording does never a, constitutes an abandonment of an underlying work, even under current law. Does anyone contradict me? Uh, all right. Well, anyway, that's the issue. It's now before a judge in uh, New York. And we, we're kind of pleased that they're getting off on that issue because the more important issue is still uh, substantiality. <coughs> Any other questions? OK. Oh, no? No, well, we have another. Is, how would you, if a, a university mandate a uh, holder of the, uh, of the facts of all the archives I If they accept it, I'm going to offer it this afternoon. I sent the piano to them. They have the Fatswaller piano. They sent the Fatswaller record collection. They accepted that. Now I'm bringing one fourth of my attic. My wife is complaining that my house is falling down. I've got, I refuse. I even have the works of Noah Webster up there. <laughs> I won't throw an exhibit away. Anything that comes across my desk, I put up in the attic. And so, if only they'll cooperate. This is 50 pounds. I have another 150 of uh, Fats Lawler stuff. I have Duke Ellington up there. Really, it's like a little museum. But what I want you to see is, I want to challenge some student to use the money that we're giving for scholarship purposes and come into the music business because we really do need aggressive lawyers who are going to assert some of these new rights to protect the creative people. And that's my goal, to try to get a student from Howard University who will come on, come on board and uh, keep the flag flying. OK, I guess we're done. Yeah, <laughs> please do. <laughs> well, I only went through one third of what I brought. Too bad. How frustrating. Yeah.